the goal as an entrepreneur in creating good culture, you don't need them to believe in what you're doing. You need them to believe that you believe in what you're doing. If you sell anything, if you're in relationship with anybody, if you're trying to get people to do whatever it is you would like for them to do. I have with me Chris Lee, who is a serial entrepreneur who's had two nine-figure exits, expert when it comes to building culture and sales. For in the last nine years, I've spent about a million dollars on my personal education, specifically to study what these guys were doing to build culture. The reality is, is most successful cultures have been done on purpose. And those people that really figure it out realize that there's an actual methodology and a design to creating it. Brand is what separates you from everyone. It makes you unique, a one of one. And brand is really rooted in culture and so like creating something that's unique a one-of-one -one experience allows you to charge more make more give more I've created a methodology and I've, I've got 10 steps to building a phenomenal culture step number one is I have with me Chris Lee who is a serial entrepreneur who's had two nine-figure exits he's a podcaster family man man of God but also is uh, right now, I would say, an ex expert when it comes to building culture and sales. And so I'm so excited to have you on the department. Thank you for hopping on. Dude, excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, usually I do interview people that I actually know. This is my second one that I've done where I'm like, I'm gonna get to know you while we talk. No problem. Um, and we shot a podcast for your podcast um, just moments ago, which is called The Founders Podcast. and. Really quickly, I do want to start off by saying you sold a company or two. Yeah. And you decided to go in on podcasting. Absolutely. Why? You know, I've always been <clears throat> obsessed with building a brand. Uh, for the longest time, it was building a brand for the benefit of my business, right? Like building <clears throat> internally to my people, building an awesome culture or whatnot. And so I've, and I've known that the next level for me was always to go and build my own personal brand, speaking on stages, podcasting, those type of things, um, because I feel that through a personal brand is the way I can actually leave a legacy and impact millions of lives rather than just my own small circle of influence. That's cool. So I like, like you saw, you see the value exceeds even what you made in what you did to build the company that you exited. Yeah, I think a lot of that is centered on the fact that I don't think that money is like the true value that we're after, mm. right? Money is a derivative of value created, right? You get a lot of different derivatives besides money. And so for me, I'm constantly chasing value creation. And yes, money allows us for more value creation and you know continue to magnify that. So yeah, like, for me, I, I just find so much joy and happiness in creating value. And so like, that was the natural next step for me. Dude, I love, and, and I just love, because like, dude, content creation, I always like to say has changed my life. Yeah. It's changed my relationships. Yep. My, it has changed my finances. It's changed opportunities. Um, and, and it's just, it's cool to see somebody at your level really go into building your personal brand now uh, in this era. You, you said, you know, brand, how brand affects businesses. Like you've been a part of that, even though it didn't always look like this. Mm -hmm. Why does brand affect business? I mean, ultimately brand is what separates you from everyone. It makes you unique, a one of one, right? Like you, you can be in a commoditized industry. Like for example, I was, I was in a very commoditized industry, the solar industry, right? Like there's not really much to differentiate between a solar panel on a roof, uh, depending on the manufacturer or whatnot. But what differentiates is the way that you go to the marketplace, the way you sell it, the way you deliver it, the experience, right? And so all that goes into tying into what a brand truly is. And, and brand is really rooted in culture. Mm -hmm. And so like that. creating something that's unique, a one-of-one -one experience allows you to go charge more, make more, give more. And, and so that is what I have like made my life about being obsessed with creating something that is unique and different from everyone else. Dude, I love that you make the connection of brand and how culture is a big part of that. But what's crazy is I've been a part of a lot of culture, you know, teachings and trainings, but nobody's talking about 
like brand. Right. And then likewise, you're talking about branding. We're not really talking about culture. Right. So how have you seen those merge and then, and then we'll, we can unpack it? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think most people look at culture as just a buzzword. Something hip to talk about. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we got a cool one. Everyone knows how a good culture feels or a bad culture feels, mm. right? Like you walk into a room, you're like, yeah, I don't like it here, right? Like you get a gut feeling, maybe something like pushing through your heart. Like you're like, what's going on? You can't necessarily put your finger on it. Or you're like, oh man, there, there's energy in here. It's vibe. It's, you know, something is going on that's unique. And those people that really figure it out realize that there's an actual methodology and a design to creating it. Mm. And, and so like, and, and when you can create it, that's what ultimately creates your brand, which ultimately sells, right? And, and uh, in any business, you have two customers. One are your employees. Like that is your most important customer that there is. That's because really if you create a brand and a culture for them, they are going to represent you phenomenally to your end user, whatever it is, whatever your service, your product, or any anything else is. And so the first sale you have to make is to your people, mm. right? And so for me, I have always been like, that is what my calling in, in life is, is to develop out these people on purpose, by design, not by default. Because you don't get a choice on whether or not you have a culture, right? You get a choice on whether you design your culture or not, mm. right? When it's done by default, Sometimes you get lucky, right? Sometimes you're naturally good at it and, you know, good on those unicorns. But the reality is, is most successful cultures have been done on purpose, right? Like they go about it with a methodology. They have a, they have certain mantras, certain core values, mission statements that they live by and they do not deviate from. And so like, my whole mission in entrepreneurship has been studying how do I create a phenomenal culture? Who's doing it the best? Like early in my career, I learned from mentors. I read books, spent money on my personal education. Like since 2015 to today, which is 2024, in the last nine years, I've spent about a million dollars on my personal education, right? And it's just like with the pursuit of this, like figuring out culture. And so when we, when we eventually launched my business that I sold for a nice little valuation to private equity, um, we launched out of my garage in 2017. From day one, we were doing things on purpose, like mm. from the way that I would greet my employees to what our core values were, to like the way we hosted meetings, to the different identity marketers that we that we had that separated us and created a unique offering to the marketplace. Like, and, and I know that's a lot. No, that's right? great. But, I'm unpacking it in my brain. Um, I think being intentional is so important, right? I always, I actually, my definition of culture, I guess in organizations or in businesses and stuff, my definition of culture is culture is subculture. It's because I've seen, I've seen, I've been a part of organizations where they say one thing, but what's going on when the doors are closed, that's the culture. Right. And I love that you pointed out that your first priority is the employees. Your first priority is the inner group because, because subculture is created with that inner group. So it's actually the fruit of what is being taught and then what actually is being ex exemplified um, and celebrated and all those things. It creates kind of like the conversations that have when, when people get frustrated, what's the first thing they do? Do they, do they talk crap behind the back? Do they, do they uh, you know, actually, is there a process for that? Is there an openness to being able to share frustrations? And I think when you say be more intentional, would you say that that would be like the biggest thing you got out of spending a million bucks in learning culture? It just being intentional? Yeah. Uh, no, that's like the very basis, right? Like that, that is like where you have to start is one, it's got to be un intentional. Okay, but then the, the question is intentional about what? Right. Mm. Like, what do I need to do to develop out an incredible culture? And so that's where I've created a methodology and I've, I've got 10 steps to building a phenomenal culture. Step number one is, is you have to start with a mission and a vision, right? A mission is what is ambiguous. It doesn't matter what industry you are in, okay? It can be applied to any industry. So like if I started a business today and I created a 
a mission statement for the business, and we decided to change to a different industry tomorrow, the mission statement would still apply. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. and, and so, like, for example, in our business, it was building a brighter future for our people. You know, there, there was definitely some ties to the solar industry, brighter, right? Like, whatever else. But it was, it was all about our people are two different things, right? Our two different end users, our employees, then our, then our customers, and building, actively creating, right? And a brighter future. We're constantly focused. And this is not just more money. It's creating the whole human, which is the physical economic association and spirituality of the human, right? Focusing on that for my employee, not just getting them a more of a paycheck, but helping them be better fathers, mothers, sisters, contributors to society, spiritual human beings, more physically able, like like that whole aspect, okay? And so- would like, you, So you would say coming up with a mission and vision, that process should come from a, a deep well yes. of who you are yes. as the leader of- But mission and vision are two separate things, right? okay? So a mission is something that can apply to any industry. A vision is pretty industry specific, right? So like, for example, our business, our vision, our, our vision uh, was to build the largest solar or residential solar installer in the, in the nation and be the gold standard of the industry. Right. And so it gave a very like measurable thing, right. That we could compare against the rest of the industry. It's like, this is the North star. It's big, it's gnarly, it's audacious. It's way out there. Right. But you as an employee know if I'm rowing in the right direction, is this getting us closer to our direction, right? The, the vision of the business and does it align with our mission? right? Like, is it doing things that are going to better our people, right? Like, is it creating a brighter future? And so those kind of are both big Northern stars. Like and, and so you have to create that first. And then the second aspect, step number two, is you have to have core values that you value most as a founder, as an organization. And this has to have to be your guiding principles that you do everything off of. You hire, you fire, you promote, you recognize, you do everything. Like most people... Core values are literally just something on a wall. They address it once or twice ever. Yeah, they might have like had the people memorize it at one point or another, but then that's it, right? And, and so that's where most organizations get this stuff wrong, right? Most of it's just a mantra on the wall, never used, never implemented, right. never recognized. And so then, then I go into like depth of like how that has to be utilized in order to run an incredible organization. This applies to families, this applies to business, this applies to churches. Yeah, the everything. thing that comes to mind is, because I think a lot of people that consume my podcast are um, either W-2s, they're solopreneurs, yeah. or they have a small business and maybe they have a couple employees. But I feel like something that can get you prepared for a season of doing this at a high level is to do it for yourself. Absolutely. Like create a mission and vision statement for yourself. Yep. Create core values for yourself. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And so then with the core values, they need to be memorizable, right? Usually I recommend that if you can create an acronym that aligns, mm -hmm. like that would be awesome. Like my business was SolGen, which standard, stood for Solar Generated Power. But we also created our core values as an acronym of SolGen. Synergy, outside the box, thinking, love of family, generosity, excellence, and no excuses, right? Like those were the, the six core values. But then that became the basis of the way that we ran our lives, right? And so if you're doing this on a personal basis, you ask yourself on a daily basis, okay, am, what I'm doing, is this align with my core values, mm -hmm. right? Is this next project? Does this uh, this next business decision? Does this align with my core values? Same thing with building a team. If I'm hiring an individual, I'd say, all right, one of our core values is excellence. What does excellence mean to you? Oh, uh, excellence means this. Okay, give me an example of the way that you were excellent in your previous work experience. Or same thing with like no excuses. One of our core values is no excuses. We take ownership of everything we do. When was a time? that you own something that wasn't necessarily easy to own, mm. right? Like these are these would be interview questions, okay? And then the same thing would be for analyzing their performance and deciding whether or not you're gonna fire them. You have a little grid and it would be like, always, sometimes, never, all core values, okay? And you're going to grade them as their manager, mm. okay? Are they always synergistic? Do they always look for a one plus one equals three opportunity? 
Are they constantly outside the box thinking? Are they looking for new bright ideas? Do they express love of family? Are they, do they have a value of family at home, family at work, right? Like, do they do this? Is it always, is it sometimes, is it never? And then you decide and you should go through it and you grade them on a quarterly basis, monthly basis, whatever it is. And then you decide, okay, what are my standards with these things, okay? So is it a three strike rule that if they hit a never, at three different times, like so they maybe they hit it once, and then I go and I have a one on one conversation with them. I'm like, hey, you're falling short, you're not being very generous, mm -hmm. right? Like, you, it's all about you here. The, the, it's not even a sometimes, it's always all about you. We've got to have a direct conversation here. If we continue down this route, unfortunately, you're not going to be a good fit for the organization. Have you ever wondered to yourself or asked yourself the question when you watch my content, how the heck does Omar's quality of video? look and sound so dang crispy. It's literally the number one question I get asked, whether it's privately in the DMs or people commenting on my videos on Instagram or even on YouTube. The reality is I believe the quality of videos that I've been able to produce has been the recipe to my success online. And I wanna give you access to my live document where I've listed out everything I use, both for the podcasts I create, to the YouTube videos I make, as well as to what I use for my smartphone to make it look and sound amazing. The reason I put it on a live doc is because I keep this document updated in real time with everything that I'm using. So just head over to the videodep.co forward slash crispy or just click the link down in the show notes. Let's get back to the conversation. Okay. So one of those values were, was family. Yeah. And I love it. How, how did you get through the, I mean, sometimes family could be used as a, 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 a safe word mm -hmm. to, to excuse I think poor relationship and culture because it's like you know you do what you can for the family yep you know like and i've been a part of organizations where it's like wait hey, we're not a family we're a team but we're not a family yep and it was like oh really and i got that was like the consensus and i totally understood like team they have alignment and goal but like family we're not trying to you know there's there's, there's a job that needs to be done and let, let's get this job done together I don't know, like how... No, how, no, yeah. that's a great question. So first and foremost, your core values have to be yours mm -hmm. and yours only. You don't need to conform with society. You don't need to do what's politically correct. You don't need to, like, if it works for you and not for me, that's fine. You're not part of my organization. Yeah. That's not who I want to attract. So love of family isn't isn't this necessarily just like the soldier family? It's actually, I value family values, right? Like mm -hmm. I want to build society. I want to be someone that contributes and give back. Even if I have a terrible at home family life, I want to help improve that. Right. And, and so like, like that, that was more of the, the core value, but to, to your point, was soldier in a family? Absolutely. Did we believe in loyalty? No. Loyal, loyalty is where people get it wrong mm, in business. Really so we believe in trust and not loyalty. Mm. Loyalty is I do things regardless of what you do for me, right? Like uh, if you're unequitable in our relationship, I still stay loyal to you. That's bull crap in business. And I think too many business owners expect that and it really screws them. Uh, because what happens is when uh, that's a slave and a master mindset, okay? Like you are loyal to this position and you have no choice in it. That is a slave master mentality. And what happens to a slave when they want to leave? They leave in the middle of the night, right? And so that, and here's the unique thing, where a trusting relationship is, and, and this is this is all part of our culture and, and it's something that I truly believe, is that a trusting relationship has to be equitable, right? Like, I have to provide opportunity for you as an employee that is equitable, pays you right, not just in money, yeah. pays you in culture, pays you in opportunity, pays you in other things. I'm helping you become a better person all around, right? That's And, and in turn, you're giving me your best effort. Anytime that trust is broken, I'm either going to fire you or you fire me, mm. right? And, and, and the beauty of it is, right? So most employees, they either outgrow the business, grow with the business, or are left behind, right? Like it's one of, one of the three things. And if they outgrow the business, they should leave, right? And, and I actually encourage my employees. I'm like, look, I don't expect you to be here forever. That's a slave and owner uh, like a, a mentality. You do not need to be here forever, but 
I will do my very best to provide an opportunity where you want to be here for, for as long as possible. And, and, and creating, and, and so uh, uh, what we would say is like, look, whatever experience you have, please take it and use it for the rest of your life. I hope that, uh, you know, one of the vision statements I would always share with my people is, I hope that you can look back as your experience here at Solgen as a foundation for the rest of your life. Whether you go on and run your own business, whether you stay here for the next 15 years, whatever it is, I want you to value and trust what you have today. Mm. And, and what that creates, we never had star players lose or leave because they had that trusting relationship. If they had another offer, they had another opportunity, they would come and talk to us. Yeah, that's good. Versus that's leaving culture. in the that, yeah. That's the culture. That, that's yeah, the culture. That's like, good. hey, look, Chris, this I'm considering this. Man, it's been awesome. Thank you so much. And they were comfortable because I would tell them, hey, it's okay if you leave. Yeah. It's okay. And they would come. And guess what? Nine times out of 10, we'd be able to like, dude, did you know that you have an opportunity here? Or you have an... Oh, I didn't realize that. Thanks for clarifying that with me, man. I'm going to turn these guys down and I'm going to stick stick it out. Yeah. Right. And, and so, it, like, I that like is that. that is the core so of like when, when you're talking about family. Yeah. It's it's a trusting relationship, not a loyalty relationship. I love that. Craig Rochelle, uh, leadership guy. He he says that there's two ways that you can create trust in a relationship, and you can make somebody either earn it or you can extend it first and let them lose it. Yeah. And he said, they both have pros and cons, but he said, the reason why we extend it is so it allows us to move faster. Yes. Hey, you are empowered the speed to of trust. crush this, yeah. and it's on you to actually ruin the trust yeah. as opposed to you know you trying to work for it. Yeah, I mean, I could talk about trust forever, right? Stephen, Stephen Covey talk, you know, the the speed of trust. You know, you you earn trust one drop at a time, and uh, you know, in a bucket, and it can be lost with one swift kick. Mm -hmm. You know, like there, there's like there's so many aspects to building phenomenal trust. But yes, like trust. There's the reason why in the five dysfunctions of the team, the number one dysfunction of any terrible team is a lack of trust, mm -hmm. right? You have to establish trust. You establish it through vulnerability. There's all different types of ways that you actually create it. But uh, but that just kind of goes back into this whole aspect of creating a culture yeah. that lasts. So was that number two or was that step three? The, yeah, you, the core you, started, you started getting into the core values. Yeah. So, so step number two is having core values. But but you hire, you fire, you recognize, you promote, right? Like these are it's constantly part of your meetings. Like dude, there, I I could literally talk about step two for the rest of the podcast. Yeah, I, like, like, I mean, yeah. there, there's like, yeah. there's so many aspects that go into there, but like, uh, but at the end of the day, like the most important thing in building any culture is consistency. Whatever you choose to do, whatever you do by design, it has to be done over and over again, regardless how you feel. Mm, that's really good. Just walk through quickly, step three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Just yeah. and then we'll go into the questions I have that uh, I, it, you know, I I will leave it. It, it will it will take too it take long. Too long? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but we can uh, so, so yeah, if, where you, can if you're look if you're looking for it on my Instagram under my links, there's I sell a twenty nine dollar uh, ten step guide. Dope. So I would say jump into there, grab grab it That's all. That's good. And I, I and I think people at every level should consider this, you know. Uh, especially for self-leadership. Yes, yeah. yeah. It, it literally, culture applies, to your point, one-man team, two-man team, family, church, whatever. It is, it is literally the root of our society. So you sold your business after starting it in 2017? Yes. That's, that's kind of fast. <laughs> like, how do you even sell a business? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great question. Most people have no idea. Well, because so. like, yeah, most people are starting businesses out of a, you know, a problem they're solving. Yep. They, maybe they stumbled into it or it's like a passion. But like the concept of selling to a guy like me who's creative and I even just think of like, no, nah, man, nobody's going to buy this thing. But like, do, did you build it to sell? And yeah, absolutely. So how did you even know to do that? Yeah. So, I mean, it was really my previous experience, right? Okay. You can say 2017 to 2023, man, that's fast. That's great. I mean, I'm 39, almost 40 years old, right? I have a lifetime of entrepreneur experience. I built my own businesses up before this. I've had failures. I've had little successes. I went and worked for, uh, after owning several businesses, I went back to work for somebody else to oh, study. Wow. Um, so I, uh, over a 
four and a half year period of time. I worked for three different organizations specifically to study what these guys were doing to build culture, to build businesses, to sell, to build things on purpose, right? Meanwhile, going to masterminds and coaching events and like it just everything really culminating into launching this business fall of 2017 out of my garage, right? Day one, absolutely everything on purpose from where we spent our money. The reason I launched it out of my garage is because I knew that a facility didn't really matter. That was the least ROI. The best ROI was marketing, mm. branding, and team. And so I started spending money. And, and I have a pretty nice garage. It was a 3,500-square-foot shop. Eventually, we grew out of that. We had 53 people showing up uh, every single day and out of my solar? garage in the solar industry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so we had 53 people. We were bur bursting at the seams. By the time we moved out of my garage, we had several locations, but that was our headquarters. We'd already done $75 million in business in two and a half years. And uh, But going back to day one, everything was on purpose from the organizational chart that we were creating like we had a roadmap to, okay, this is how we go when we build a hundred million dollar business, right? Like this is how many employees we need. This is how many salespeople we need, like going through and structuring all this. All right. This is how I'm going to interact with my employees. These are the things I'm going to create for a vision and mission. And don't get me wrong. I didn't have it all figured out. I had a good amount figured out through a lot of study and experience, but a lot of things I was learning along, along the way, but like, uh, I'll give you an example, like some of the markers and things that I did. Like day one, I was like, all right, I'm going to give everybody a high five when they walk in. When I walk in and greet my employees every single day with a high five. Seems weird, seems whatever, but I'm going to do it. So every morning, high five, good morning, how are you? Tell me about your day, boom. That started with like, for, we're in our 400 square feet in, in the shop. There's six of us. We're doing it. People are like, this is weird, whatever. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, I'm preaching vision. I'm like, hey, in, we are going to be the largest solar provider. Like, yeah, right, dude. We are in a unair conditioned uh, shop. Like, you are smoking crack. Like, like that, I mean, that. I know that that's what they were thinking, but I believed it, right? And, and, and the goal as an entrepreneur in creating good culture is you got to be an evangelist. You don't need them to believe in what you're doing. You need to, the, them to believe that you believe in what you're doing. Right. Right. Like that is the whole goal is that I am so convinced myself that these people are bought in. Like, man, he's like, I don't think we're going to get there. Do you, but do you had, did you have like a morning routine before those like vision meetings and stuff like that? You like get your mind right. Like, cause you know, you're, you're, you have to show up again for yourself before you show up for the other people. Like what would be your, you know, you know, it's funny because I, I know like Armozi right now is just like dissing on morning routines. He's like, oh, that's bull crap, right? Like successful people don't have morning routines until after they're successful. Like, no, that's not no, true. Dude, I lo love what Alex talks about, but also, yeah, don't, like, oh, bro, stop talking about family. You don't have a family. Right. Okay, right. okay. Don't, yeah. don't talk about family. Don't talk you, got, about you got five kids. Yeah, dude. You can I talk got, about family. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I had a morning routine. And, and like I had a year prior to this, I had fi figured out my physical fitness, right? And that was like a big changing point mm. in my career. Up until that point, I was fat and, and like just didn't make it a huge priority. And then there was a snapping point in which I entered a competition, won a bunch of money uh, because I'm a very competitive guy. I'm like, dude, fitness is necessary. And so my morning routine was, yes, I worked out most days, yeah. not a hundred percent, but most days I would work out. Most days I would read my scriptures. Most days I would say a prayer. Most days I would spend a little bit of time with my wife and my, and my kids. Right. And anybody that claims to be a hundred percent is lying to mm -hmm. you. Right. But my goal is always to get a passing grade. Right. If I, if I'm a C or a B, like I'm, I'm winning. Right. If, if I got more in the positive column than the negative column, then I'm, then I'm winning. So like that helped me get jazzed before the That's other day. Good. But a lot of times it was self-talk, right? Like look in the mirror, like I do not feel like it today, but I'm going to smile, all right? Like Chris, you're going to smile. When you walk in that door, you got to bring the heat. Okay, boom. Hey, good morning. And like six minutes before I was depressed and like uh, just like being bogged down by cities and licensing and like potential fines and everything else that's like crumbling down around me. But I knew who's my number one customer. 
these guys mm. and I have to sell them on it and I have to see help them see that I believe in this and I have to bring the energy right like I, I have one friend that says being a CEO is the chief energy officer like you've got to bring the energy and if you're the CEO of your family the CEO of just yourself the CEO of your church you've got to first and foremost focus on bringing energy. That's so good. And so like that was the first thing that I did by design was bring energy every single day. And later it became exhausting. Yeah, because like, I, would, I would ask, how do you do that and, and not come off as disingenuous? Uh, you know, is that I really believe that who I am, right? Like, like it's, it's not, it wasn't fake for me. Like sometimes I had to get myself into a position, right, where I didn't feel it, but it was never fake. I truly believe that energy is real and, and that I can bring good energy. And so like, what? I don't think that's fake. Yeah, okay. And, and so, but like later, it, it became difficult when we had our 23,000 square foot uh, national headquarters that we built, it was beautiful. And we had 300 employees showing up to there every single day. Dude, it would take me an hour to go and give high fives every single morning. But I was committed to it, man. It, it was, I had been going for five years, you know, and, and it's something that my people became like uh, obsessed with receiving that energy. In fact, now that I've left and I still have employees working back there, they're like, man, dude, we miss that. Mm. We miss that. Like the, the culture isn't the same. And, and so like, just realize one, you're the captain of your own destiny. And two, like, like you can do whatever you want. You just got to be consistent at it. That's good. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think what's cool about something you mentioned is that the people miss you doing that. But I think there is something to say that that's the power of, of the human, you know, like to think that, like, if you were to left, that's probably when it would be disingenuous. It would be like, hey, this is what we do. We give high fives. But no, no, that's something you felt convicted on. Right. And so you don't you're not you're not dumping your convictions or how your makeup on whoever it's coming next. I don't know. What was your involvement after it got sold? Was it like kind of like a... Yeah, so I, st I stayed on the CEO for uh, about a year and, and then uh, I've stepped into the chairman role. I, I rolled some equity forward. I'm, I'm still you know, somewhat involved. In fact, uh, earlier this week, I went and I did a sales training for the guys and like, man, we we missed that. You know, and so I, I still have a, a chance to go in and... and you know, sprout off a little bit of my energy in, in, into the group. But, uh, but yeah, like it, it's, it's interesting. Culture, culture is a living organism. It has to be addressed on a daily basis, mm. right? Like uh, that's why consistency is the most important thing. It can't be done once, right? It's not eat 30 apples a day and you're good for the month. It's gotta be one that's every really single day. Dude, that's really good. I think about like some places that have good culture, good values, good stuff, but it's just not consistent. Right. So the inconsistency is creating uh, a culture that's not desirable. And you know, the, the thing about consistency is consistency doesn't mean perfection. Consistency means truth. Mm. And, and what, what I mean by that is when you drop the ball in your everyday pattern, you own the fact that you drop the ball. So when you screw up in communication, when you screw up in like your daily practices, when you do it, you actually put that out there. Hey, look, hey, I'm sorry I didn't come and give high fives yesterday. My bad, I dropped it, I'm gonna do my very best. Or, hey, we screwed up, we didn't communicate this properly to the customer, uh, to the organization, we changed this way that we're doing things, we own the fact that we, uh, you know, we, we screwed this thing up. And, and so like that is what I mean by, by consistency. Most people do not operate from a point of truth, right? If they screw up, they just try to ignore it and act like it never happened. And then like, hey, here, here we back with high fives. No, you can't be back with high fives if you skipped high fives yesterday. You'd be back with high fives. You say, hey, guess what? I screwed up yesterday. I wasn't here for the high fives. Here I am today. Yeah, no, that's really good. And yeah, I think about what about what would you say to people? What are they, what is what are they going to miss out on by choosing to not be consistent? I mean, you know, we're living in a time where like lifestyle entrepreneurship, you know, is is a thing and kind of like freedom to do what you want. You're building a business so you can do what you want and all that stuff. And and like what you're talking about is a is like going all in building a company. Um, what would you say to a person at the level who says like I don't know if I want to do that, but I do want to like do something awesome. You know, excellence isn't for everyone. Mediocrity is for most. Mm. And and so people that aren't willing to go all in will just get mediocre results. 
right? Like if I'm mediocre in my, in my gym efforts, I'm going to get mediocre. If I'm mediocre in my relationships, I'm going to get that, right? Yeah. Like it's like, what do you want? And the compound effect is very real, right? The, the law of motion, the big mo is real, right? Like if I do the little things over and over again, 1% better is atomic habits yep. or whatever else the, these different uh, <laughs> gurus talk about. This is real stuff. Yeah. And that's something I learned like, uh, Earlier in my career, kind of midpoint in my career, I went and saw people that were just as talented as me, uh, that we started from the same point, but they were leaps and bounds ahead of me. And I said, what is this guy doing that's different? And the only thing I could put my finger on is that they were doing very small things more consistently. That's it. And, and I was just like, oh, that's it? Like, wait, you're not that incredible in person, but you're getting incredible results. It's just, you know, the compound effect. One times two times two times two times two times two after 15 days, boom, or 15 years, right? And, and I would say that most people aren't dedicated to the long term, right? We need to think of decades, not years, not days. Uh, and so, like, I know that the law of success requires me to be committed for the next 10 years. It doesn't necessarily mean I have to do it for 10 years. It's just I got to be committed to doing it for the next 10 years. And then if I get lucky, it'll happen in a shorter period of time. Most entrepreneurs that aren't willing to do things, it's because they're not committed to their goals. They're not committed to doing something. They're like, I want to change, chase the next shiny object. I want the laptop lifestyle. I just want to have just enough money. It's because they're motivated by money, not by value creation. Mm, that's really good. Can you define value creation? Yeah, value value creation. So money is just an end result of something that you do. Is it possible to create value and not get money? Absolutely, right? Like, and this is my favorite example. I have 23 acres and I grow cherry trees, okay? And one of the reasons I do this is because I love a place for my kids to work and develop them as human beings. But I am obsessed with what fruit trees teach us about leadership and life. And I, so I have cherry trees. The unique thing about cherry trees is they are a early season. So right out of the winter, they start blooming and they're beautiful. But what can happen some years is that a frost comes in and kills the blossoms. And guess what? That season, no fruit. Mm. Does that mean the tree's bad? No. It doesn't. The goal is not the fruit. It's not the production at the end of the season. It's being the tree, right? And so what I am focused on in creating value is, is watering, fertilizing, trimming, pruning, being like this beautiful tree that is capable of producing fruit. I know that alternate things are going to happen. Sometimes there's going to be years of bad weather. Sometimes there's going to be bad partnerships, some poor decision-making, whatever else that is going to impact the fruit being produced. Just for a season though. Just for the season. But in, And so what most people do when they're focused on the fruit or the output or the money is when it doesn't produce it, they chop the tree down. Oh, this tree doesn't work. It's not the right thing. Dude, this is a beautiful fruit bearing the, the potential, right? Like, and the goal is to be that to be able to create value in this. And so occasionally you're going to be able to bask in wonderful cherries at the end of the season. And, and so, like, that's always been my goal is like, I need to be this awesome tree. And, and, and the and trees teach you about putting roots down first before it actually shows you anything on the outside, right? Like most success is not seen, it's actually felt, right? Like and so like that's when, when you ask, like, what is what is value creation? It's being the best version of yourself. It's impacting the lives of others, regardless of how much money you make. A scoreboard gets wiped clean at the ever, end of every game. Does that mean that you suck as a, as a player? No, you have just the same ability to go back and produce. And the way I learned this is, man, I went through bankruptcy. I had, you know, all my possessions repossessed, less than $1,000 in my bank account. I had my, my third child was being born in 2011. Zero, literally, I'm down to zero. And I realized... Guess what? I still all have my whole skill set. I still am a tree, although my scoreboard has been wiped clean. Yeah. I can get back to it. And you know what? I'm no longer afraid of zero because I've experienced it. And most people will never be willing to go to zero. And that's why they don't find success. That's good. So you skill sets. And I feel that. Like skill sets 
are really what make you recession proof yes. or any economy proof. Absolutely. And uh, you teach sales or you did teach sales. Yeah. And what would you, can you define what sales is? I, I went on a journey last year to make that my number one skill to get better in. Yep. And kind of why I joined the mastermind that I did and just being uh, more cognizant of how important it is to be good at it, yep. you know? But what is sales? Sales is identifying pain and providing a solution with a product or service that you represent. That's it. And and it's but it's got to be a specific solution to their specific pain. And the the best example I'll give is this. If I walk onto a Tesla parking lot and the car salesman comes up to me and tries selling me a Tesla without properly identifying my pain, they're going to try to sell me the wrong product, okay? There's only one reason I buy a Tesla. One reason and one reason only. I have the pain of not being able to use my phone when I drive, okay? I want to text. I want to call. I want to stay busy while I am driving. And there is one feature on a Tesla that allows me to do this, auto drive. It is the most amazing thing on earth. Like I hit it twice. I am down in. I can <laughs> dial in all these different things, right? And so if, if a salesman is going to sell me a Tesla, he's going to say, okay, what causes you pain when you drive like what you know he's going to go and find it and i'm like dude i am a sucky driver and i like i'm scared that i'm gonna die at the wheel because i love to text and drive right like that is my pain that's associated with driving dude is that the only thing that that uh, that scares you yeah what are what are your main motivators for a car dude just that they can take care of that pain for me and be reliable Boom, I got you a nice Tesla Model 3. I don't need the freaking Model S Plaid. I don't care that it's fast. I don't care that it's electric. I don't care about any of these other features that could appeal to someone completely different. Yeah. Right? And, and so what I always teach salespeople is spend time and do question-based selling. Find out what is their pain. And do I have a solution to that pain? And only focus on that. Ignore all the other features. Ignore that it's fast, that it's electric, that it looks cool, all these other things. Just if his pain is he wants a reliable car that's going to allow him to text and drive, give him the base model. And that's literally what, so I drive two Tesla. Me and my wife have Teslas. They're both base models. I don't have anything else uh, that, that is like super cool because cars don't make me tick, right? And, and so like that's the best example I can give to anybody of like what sales is Good. and being able to apply it and then just being a fanatic about your product, being that evangelist, getting your customer to believe that you believe in your product. Yeah, that's good. I, I found that in in the process of growing in, in the skill of sales is listening is so key. And as a content creator, what I didn't realize that I was really good at because like I was making content and people were persuaded to buy whatever it was I was talking about on a video, but it, it's because I... I'm listening to that pain. It's if you want to be good at sales, you should be a better become a better listener. Yeah. And here's what it's done is when I'm in a conversation and you tell me your pains, like you told me when you walked in, like, yeah, dude, we haven't gotten YouTube figured out. It's like I can address that. Uh, and I don't want to talk about any other platform, but but use like specifically the verbiage and the the word choices you're using, it's copy as a marketer. Right. So, you know, when people say, dude, like, I, I just hate how my how I look on video. Okay, I'm gonna use that as an email headline. Do you hate how you look on video? Mm. It's gonna resonate because you're literally using their language. And I just found out like, just become a better listener, and then and then in your marketing, use the the same phrases. You know, um, there you know there's a there's a term in in production called uh, uh, bokeh or uh, depth of field, mm. but most people just want the blurry background. So for me to get you to click on this email that would teach you that very thing. Just, do you want the blur, blurry background? That's it. Are you, are you trying? <laughs> it's funny. I, I actually. Do you want to, do you want to pop out in your videos? That's what they're like <laughs> yeah, using. Yeah. So like, yeah. I, I just shot a podcast the other day with this guy that runs a billion dollar business up in Canada and literally he emails me afterward and he's like, dude, what equipment are you using to get a blurry background? Yeah. <laughs> like that, that, that is the exact but the, And then as the, as the expert or the person that's selling, you know, it's the lens and the camera right. combination and all that stuff. But I think that's really good. Like if, um, 
I'm trying to I'm trying to think about like a person who doesn't think they need to be good at sales, but if you freaking are going into business, it's it's almost everything. Sales is the root of everything, the yeah. root of relationships, the root of getting what you want. The, so don't go into business if you don't want to get you want and get what you want, and you have to learn sales in order to get what you want. That yeah. is pretty simple, dude. I've been I, I I've been doing it in parenting too. I yeah. saw so like so Ruby's five years old. And I'm teaching Amanda that she can be persuaded to do the thing that we know she needs to do. Absolutely. And we, obviously, as parents, we understand that it's in her best interest to take a bath. Yeah. But maybe if I just say, hey, Ruby, go take a bath, she's not going to want to. But if I say, hey, Ruby, you want to get dessert after dinner? Yeah. What if we have dinner, you take a bath, and then we go get yogurt land? It's a yes. you know. Every and time. it's just all how it was framed. It's me understanding how Ruby you know, functions and how she likes certain things. But I, I just think more people, if you got better at sales, I think your life would be better. Yeah, yeah. Abso absolutely. I, I attribute the, I mean, most, uh, my early career was knocking on doors. I mean, talk about a drinking from mm. a fire hose in marketing and sales, right? Marketing, I'm getting someone's interest, sales, I'm closing them down on an offer, right? And, and like, it, like if you do not understand this, like go get a network marketing job, go get a door-to-door -door job, go get a sales job. Like that is the best investment you can make in your career if you want to get in, eventually get into business or get anything that you want in life. Yeah, that's good. So you have five kids. Yeah. How long have you been married? Uh, 18 and a half years. That's amazing. What? How have you, as you've scaled and built and even lost it, like what would you say are some of these key principles as an entrepreneur who's a family man? Um, how do you stay intact and present? Yeah, so for me, it's priorities. God first always. Doesn't matter, right? And, and that was something that was taught by my, my parents. And so they, they helped me put value on giving back and God and just so many things. And they taught it to me from a point of not having a lot of money, which was awesome, right? And, and so like that, that was like first and foremost. And attached to that is my family, right? God and family are very synonymous for me. And, and so I, most entrepreneurs choose to build a business and then try to have a family around it. I chose to have a family and build a business around it. And, and, and so... Like the way that I am able to have a successful, and I don't claim to be perfect, and I definitely n have never always been perfect. There's been lots of times I've screwed this stuff up and everything, and I've learned through a lot of experience, but it's a balance of impact. Time balance is impossible. Balance of impact is, is possible. So if I can live in the presence, if I spend 15 minutes with my kids, but it is so impactful, so engaged, so like asking questions, that is so much more valuable than spending three hours on the couch next to them, both scrolling on phones or watching TV or anything like that. Because I understand that like being a successful business owner sometimes takes a lot of time, right? Sometimes it takes 14 hours a day. Sometimes it takes being on the road. You know, me and my wife were having a very intentional conversation three days ago. I'm like, babe, with building my personal brand, I'm going to be on the road a lot more. Right? I'm going to be traveling and doing podcasts. I'm going to be on, on stages. I said, we need to create a routine for the days that dad's home and the days that dad isn't. I said, when the kids want to have friends over, let's do it for the days that dad isn't. Right? When dad's home, let's not have friends over. Let's not have anyone else. I want that to be dad and kid time. Right? Like, I don't want there to be any other distractions. That way we can be impactful and they can still have best of both worlds. There, there's going to be time on traveling so they can have those friends. They can do those things. It's going to be very on, on purpose and intentional. I said, let's get on the same page here so that we have this like routine, the way that we study our scriptures, the way that we pray, the way, the way that we do things as a family, the way that we journal together and do these different things. And then let's have a cadence of when I'm on the road. Like, uh, should I send my my journal of gratitude via text to kind of the whole family so they see that, hey, we're still kind of keeping this, but it's a different way, right? And so just everything is very much, it has to be by design, has to be on purpose. And like I said, by no means do I have it completely figured out, but I'm learning. That's cool. I, I think it's really cool that you, you said be intentional and then you control it, right? Like you decided that when you're gone, it's that, I love that. That's, it's really good. I think a lot of people aren't considering, I think that's what it is. You're not, people aren't considering their family with the business decisions that you're making. And th like, what good is it to, you know, gain the whole world, but lose your soul yeah. or family in the yeah. process. Dude, I thank you for this podcast. I think what, what I think the theme that came out of it was just living a life of intention. Yeah. And, uh, 
the 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 amount of intention you live in it's kind it's honestly convicting you know um i'm a freaking i'm a creative man like i'm just i go with the flow and in so many ways i i know the things in my life that are intentional the ones that the things that nobody sees but i i could be way more intentional when i am upfront and with people um and and so uh, i thank you for that i think that i think i'm going to be better because of it I appreciate your time. How can awesome. people uh, connect with you and follow what it is so, you're doing? So uh, Instagram is probably the best route. I mean, all social media platforms at Chris Lee QB, like quarterback. Chris Lee is not a very unique What's QB name. QB mean? Quarterback. Oh, for real? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It was my first uh, handle. It was my first uh, email in seventh grade. Dang. You know, uh, back in the mid-90s, ChrisLeeQB at Hotmail.com. It's literally been my username for everything. Uh, it's my distinguishing factor because Chris Lee is not a very unique name. And, uh, you know, so that's uh, that's where you can cool. find me everywhere. All right, Instagram. And then you got your podcast, The Founders Podcast. So The Founder, uh, singular podcast. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, all the, all the different platforms, yeah. Dope, dude. I appreciate you being on. Yeah, thanks. If you'd like a n email sent to your inbox with the breakdown of various conversations that we are having and action items, uh, tap into the newsletter. The link is found in the show notes or the description. And uh, subscribe if you're not already. Appreciate you for watching or listening. We'll catch you in the next episode.